Man, it's so cold. Hope your vacation and holiday and all that was good. Now let's start editing again. DaVinci Resolve. I need to get somewhere with the Kino project and I thought why not do it with you guys. Okay, so documentary editing. Let me see where my levels are at. A little bit loud. Here we go. So documentary editing is pretty hard to get into because you don't know where to start. This is scratching a bit I hear. So I thought I would just go through the software a little bit, talk about DaVinci Resolve, but if you're coming from Premiere, which I know a lot of people are, uh, you shouldn't be afraid of Resolve because there's this simple thing that you can do to just get into the software. So if you come from Premiere or Final Cut or Avid, I would just suggest you go into the keyboard uh, customization and there you can just pick the keyboard customization for your um, your program. So if you come from Premiere, you can choose Premiere and then that's totally fine. Uh, and you start editing with those keyboard shortcuts. Maybe you stay with those, but it's very simple. So let me just show you before we get into the editing part of this. Um, but you would go into the DaVinci Resolve menu and then just keyboard customization. And then you would just change from my settings to whatever settings you want for the keyboard shortcuts. That simple. So anybody should be able to just try it out. And I think just because it's a great tool for me for what I do, like I come from having edited in Premiere and in Final Cut 10, but then I switched. And I just prefer Resolve because I feel it's just a one-stop shop for me where I can do everything. So when I was editing Final Cut 10 on, on the last film I did, The Pearl of Africa, I ended up at like 40 minutes or so into the film when it's that type of timeline, the whole program just slowed down and it took like an hour and an hour and a half eventually to open the whole project. So insane to be waiting. And for shorter programs, all of the programs are fine. But I think what I really love about uh, Resolve is that you have everything in one program and it's easy to just go from one uh, thing to the next, just between the panels. It just like for me that does most of the stuff myself it speeds up the process so much so I can do some sound design and I can go back and edit I can do some grading and I can go back and edit those things are very easy you can just turn off the effects of the grading and then go back and start editing again it's just very convenient and and then on top of that it's a great tool uh, but it is a, a grading tool in the beginning and for that it's perfect now for editing if you have tried Resolve before, it's been like a bit buggy and unstable and all that. I don't have that on my machine now, but I know that some people have that because you have a certain uh, threshold. So you can't use a crappy computer without changing some things. So some things that you can do to speed up the process is like working with proxies or that sort of thing. And, and that's going to help a lot. I'm not going to talk so much about that now uh, because this is going to be more about like how do you edit the doc, where do you start. Uh, but if you have any questions, let me know in the comments or in the live chat. Um, but other than that, I'm going to run through a little bit about the Kino project that we're doing. I'm going to show some scenes. Uh, I'm going to continue on the scene that we looked at last time, which you can see me edit that in, in a previous video. but. Uh, in this one, I've pretty much like finished the rough cut. So I thought it would be interesting to see like, okay, so this is where I leave it. And for this uh, like exercise that this is, it's just like looking at the scene and trying to understand what I have so that I can go back and shoot. And, and like, I need to evaluate what I shot the last time so I can structure the shoot the next time. So what I'm also going to mention a little bit is about like shooting for the edit. What is that about and how do you approach like B-roll and that sort of thing? How do you think about it? Trying to analyze the scene that I cut. Uh, yeah, but if you have any questions, just ask away. Uh, but for me, like the hardest thing is starting. And that's why I do this live stream as well to just push myself to actually get into this because I have to prepare the stuff and, and do 
uh, edit a little bit before and then I can do some uh, while we do this session and I think it's just about like starting to edit the scene the easiest way for me to understand what material I have is to just start scene by scene trying to edit them trying to get like the narrative essence out of them uh, and not doing too much of like commenting or anything um, I think that the biggest thing for me is trying to like see what action there is that you can build around to build a narrative um, but I'm gonna show that scene and, and you can understand when I comment on it um, uh, but yeah what we shot this stuff that I have here to show you is about four days uh, three days but then we shot another day that I haven't gotten the material yet so this is Scott who's to just give you a brief Scott is uh, he's cleaning up some or he's going to get some soil sample but the story is about him and the mining town that he's in so it's a little bit uh, the story here is a little bit about like just an introduction to uh, mining through him that's the first part which I cut out the second part that I have here that I'm going to show as well is more focused around like responsibilities according to him so connecting the mining and the place that they're in to the uh, first nation and how they've been exploited and how they now are being exploited uh, like the Kino city uh, citizens are being exploited but that whole thing is is just a fragment but it's something that I took out because I felt it was a good thing to kind of build upon so let me just show you this scene and then we can talk a little bit about like what it is that I've done but this is building off of the stuff that I did the last time we did this session mm. should be okay I only have two wheel drive and I'm kind of low That's Belkino, which is part of one of Alexco's lead silver mines. And this here is Klaus's uh, placer operation going up the valley. Yeah, maybe this too. What Klaus is doing down there, um, they put in a really innovative recirculating system for their settling pond, so for the wash plant. So they're reusing the water. They're not just washing and pumping it into the creek. Mm. Yeah, he's going to stay. And then maybe this one. You can try. A lot of the miners in the early days, they shafted deep in the winter, but they couldn't control the water. So maybe we've reached a threshold. Maybe it's not worth going down any deeper. Maybe it's time to take a pause, leave that stuff alone. We know there might be something down there. And maybe take the time you know, into the future to see if, if we need that resource, maybe we can think creatively of a better way to go about it. Or maybe we don't need it. I think it looks pretty good, eh? I kind of like the thrill of looking. Uh, I'm not, I couldn't give a, a rat to the duty if I ever found any amount of gold, but I want to ask questions and exercise my mind and some muscle. It's a challenge, you know. It's the profile I want just behind us, and it looks like the road's a little choppy back there. Now this stuff has all kind of been redeposited because it's been slumping down. And these are just weathered chunks of bedrock sitting pretty much where they've broken up.
There. We just, uh, we're a little vain and think that our time scale is the important one. It's like Shakespeare said something about, you know, one little inconsequential drop of sand. This could be fun. So the geological time scale, it, it, it's really humbling. It gives me hope for our future. That maybe it will undo some of the things that we've been doing. We believe that it's, you know, this unsatiable appetite can be fed forever. Okay, so that was like the, the first scene that I cut, no, a second scene that I cut with Scott. And it's basically just an introduction to him and the place that we're in and everything. Yeah. So let me just play it and I'll talk while I play it again without audio. Uh, let me just mute the program. Okay, so here we go. So what, what I'm trying to do here is, is pretty much just build up an introduction to, to him. And a lot of this is just following chronologically, but then on top of that you have to add certain stuff that is uh, just to make sense of things. So this is actually not chronological when you go from like this for instance to, to this. This is on the way down. So what you essentially are doing when you're trying to structure something from the material you get is pretty much to get a scene that has a flow and is moving forward. So now we're back on, on the way up again. Uh, him clearing the rocks and then this is late like after he's he's been shopping stuff uh, and digging but what I'm trying to do here is build up a narrative that feels like a natural scene where you're going with him so you have to have like action and motion which is him clearing up the rocks so something is happening you as an audience is here watching that as it happens and and you're following along as he's doing that yeah, so the structure that I've worked around for this whole scene is going towards him doing the soil sample. What is being said here might be changed or it might stay like this, I don't know. But it's, it's basically just looking at like how do you build uh, a scene that is flowing forward uh, that you can kind of make feel very documentary this is of course a documentary but you have to make it feel even more natural than it actually is shot because like if you just watch it real time it's super slow and nothing happens so you have to tighten it up a lot to get like it to actually feel like there's a natural flow to it um, and here like we cut into him talking and uh, as he's going and then this is actually uh, me outside which I think is before because uh, I think it might be two hills or something I don't re really remember this shot here is actually from a totally different scene this too so this is basically like b-roll stuff that isn't b-roll but it's stuff that you have to kind of collect from other scenes that work like light wise it can't be too sunny so you have to choose stuff that actually works with this so i picked those from a totally different scene just to make this flow better and be a narrative that actually makes sense uh, and that's what it's all about when you start to edit the scenes is trying to make it just flow um, and then on top of that, like I've added a narrative in terms of what he's talking about, but that's something that it's very temporary, I think, because it's going to be affected by like, where do we put it in the film? Uh, is it going to be something else? Uh, and then from this, you can also like, just imagine like he's a, he's against mining, but for mining, like he, he's against uh, pollution. I, I would say he's not against mining because he's a miner as well, but, um, you might cut this to somebody that's pro mining so it, it all depends on how do you put this and in what context this is going to be seen in the end uh, but i got some questions what was it shot on this is maddie uh, maddie hapoya who shot this on his c300 and the lab that we used was the electrosonics pdr uh, let me just show you because i have it here and i actually have that on me as well 
but this one. Uh, this is a Sanken Cos 11D, and then it's Electrosonic PDR. And then we had, uh, I think, I'm not sure what road mic Maddie had, but I had the Sennheiser 416 on my camera as well. But I didn't shoot anything in this scene. I think I shot some like stuff on the GH5 or something, but we didn't use that. Uh, so yeah, that was that part of it. Um, I think the whole scene it, it feels like it has a lot of potential as it is but this is actually a type of scene that's not it's not really something that's something special it's just a scene that brings you context into the story uh, and it all depends on like what the other scenes are and how do you cut it together how interesting this will be so if you just watch it like this it might just look like yeah nothing special uh, but when you put it in a different context where you have a build up and you have this conflict which is going to be all about uh, like the conflict between the people in in the town and uh, outside forces and all that that's when it gets interesting because you get these different perspectives kind of you know p rubbing against each other uh, but let me show you the other scene as well and i can can kind of talk about how i thought uh, about it when I broke this apart because this is the same scene but I made two different scenes out of it uh, and I'll just talk about like how I see them working in in the narrative that I see um, yeah so let me just switch over When I go out, it's not for everyone. I mean, you can't make money doing what I'm doing, poking around, but at least I'm happy to think about where I dig a hole, and I dig it with a longer handled version of this and a pick, and I fill it in, and I'm not opening up big cuts. The area that I staked was targeted by big interests for massive placer operation if I didn't stake it, and it's really important moose habitat. They can continue using that as a shelter belt and a, and a corridor. They're safe there. They always will be as long as I keep digging my holes and filling them in and having fun looking for something shiny. So we don't have to dump cyanide on mountains and rip their head off. There's room for mining, but in a different way. And one of the most important things was to respect the integrity of the values, traditional First Nation values. And I, but we're turning the Yukon into southern Canada. And I don't want to see this become an industrial wasteland. And we've messed up so much of this beautiful country, always by overturning our agreements and our treaties with First Nations. They get signed in a colonial formula and then the colonial interest walks away and doesn't honor their commitment. It's pretty humbling when you think after centuries of that and all the other things that have happened along the way, wherever you go, First Nations are still smiling and welcoming and sharing. That takes incredible courage. Okay, so this one is a bit more rough because this one has to be built out. Uh, so the idea here that I've had is to kind of leave him as he is and then go to a different character uh, who's going about their lives and everything. And then you would come back to this scene later on and that would kind of be a, a way to then go over to a First Nation character that we haven't costed yet but we are about to cost who uh, would be like continuing on this first nation and and uh, like angle of the story uh, to give some context to that so, so you want to try to pick those things out of the story and the material to have like these nice transitions between the characters to make it easier for the audience to understand what they're watching um, 
but let me just play this without audio while I talk it through. So when you look at it, we start here like with just him continuing with what he was doing before. Uh, it's just about like establishing the scene and like we're back where we were before. That's why these shots are here. Maybe there's like one too much or something. Uh, but once we have that, we go into the, the story uh, narrative, which is him talking about uh, the responsibilities and what he thinks thinks is like reckless uh, type of, uh, of mining. And then from that, you kind of continue, he's going back. It's kind of on the way to end the scene. And then we move out and we see like this is the the piles that are outside of Kino, like uh, above Kino, I think Kino is down to the right or something. And these are like the piles from the mining. Uh, so you go out to that. Now it's not liking the DJI footage at all. Uh, so back to him. I don't know, maybe we need some more like shots to make that smoother or I, I don't know how we build it up, but it feels a bit like rugged as it's cut now. But I think you need that to move out to tell uh, the context of this. And then from this we just end on the First Nation angle. And it's, it's here and I've picked it out foremost because I want a transition to that story. So you want to try to find those things as much as you can and make them into scenes. That's what this is all about. Uh, because uh, once you have the scenes, you can pretty much put any narrative in there. So uh, like thinking about it less about like what's being said and more about how do you build a natural scene is, is for me like much more important. Uh, and that kind of goes into what I was talking about earlier about like shooting for the edit. For me, that's the most important thing. Like, I don't think that you have to get everything when you are uh, when you're shooting, uh, but some stuff that makes it easier for you to shoot for that it is really to have like a a good concept for what you're doing. So this comes down to like mood boards, um, looking at the inspiration to make mood boards, uh, like look at different films, just stills, anything. Um, you want to shoot for to get the right look uh, and you want to have that nailed down before you go out because once you get into the edit and you have an editor especially if you're not the one editing like they will use any shot that is there uh, that they feel tell the story and for me as as like working as a DOP I feel like that's not a comfortable way to be in if you didn't nail the concept beforehand like how it's going to be told so that's what we talked about a lot in the beginning, me and Maddie, like how, how are we going to tell the story? Uh, and it makes it so much easier when you're on location then to actually shoot. Uh, and once you get back to the edit, like you know that you have the stuff that you need. Um, and once you get more experienced, you know that you just need to follow the action and not so much the interviews or, or what's being said. It's all about the action and capturing what's actually going on in the story through action like shooting b-roll or shooting interviews that's the the worst aspect of making a doc like that's not what doc making is about doc making is is foremost about like visualizing and telling the story with all the cinematic language and usually like for me like i just want to shoot everything silent and then i can do like sound design i can do all the stuff in post I can put everything together I just do some interviews or I do a voice or whatever it comes down to like capturing the real scenes first and just letting them unfold and having patience with it because that's the thing that I feel most people stress about like they don't wait for like 30 seconds on a shot or they don't wait for things to happen they try to switch angles all the time instead of just staying still and waiting for things to happen because they do when you have the patience for it, it they usually do uh, so usually i feel like people stress too much about like having a million angles instead of having three good ones uh, or even one good one as long as you know what you're going for that's more than sufficient to have one angle with the action that you want and then you need to figure out like how do you cut it 
and hopefully you can do that on the spot because you always need to think about like okay now when we were shooting this now i didn't shoot this scene so i can't really say too much about like what maddie was thinking i did shoot this part when he's clearing up the rocks uh, so that i can talk a little bit about like i i think about it in a way of like Okay, so here the action is going on. I want one wide shot, just establishing things. And then I want to get in, this is talking from an editor's point of view. I want something to cut into and it has to be action. So it has to be the rocks. And then I also want him talking. So I want to capture him as he's talking. The small fragments is enough, just as long as you have the audio. But you want to stay still on like one wider, then one closer. You want to have those to mix them up and, and have them flow naturally and you do that through movement. So you want to follow him and not be too quick and move too dramatically because that's going to feel like too obvious uh, as, as the narrative goes on. But you want to just like be patient with what he's doing. Move with him but not before him. Uh, like don't feel like you have to move as he moves. Just move slowly. When he moves, move with him. Don't like just rush it to just throwing the camera up and down just to capture what he's doing right now. Um, but the motion that you, you have here, it's very easy to cut to. So that's like how I approach action at least. Uh, but I think I shot until we got out of the car. So pretty much like the car, uh, I'm not sure if it was me or Maddie that shot in the car, but this whole part here uh, after this, from here, I think it's Maddie. So can't say too much about it but I, I can just expect that he's, he's looking a lot at like what's going on trying to capturing uh, what's going on in one shot rather than having like details of the soil he's clearing or something trying to get as much in in the one shot that you have but then also making sure you have coverage so you can cut it so enough angles so that it's easier to cut that's what you need to look out for um, I think that's like the crucial stuff uh, and of course like you, sh you can avoid like breaking the line of action and that sort of stuff or, like all the rules you can avoid that but we just did it here I just broke the line of action in in this one like from here to the coming shot here this this is pretty much breaking the line of action or at least it's on the line of action so you can do that, um, but you, in general, you want to avoid it if you don't have a reason for it. But as long as you have movement, it's easy to break rules, I think. Okay, so basically, most important thing, stay patient. Let me see if we got some questions here before I move on. Uh, did you sync your audio and video within Resolve? Yeah, I did. Uh, like we use a tentacle sync, but... <laughs> I messed up. Sometimes I forgot that this one resets the time code when you switch the batteries. So sometimes it's not uh, very uh, reliable. So then I did it by hand. And that's pretty easy. Like it, it's very quick to do. It's not something that I think about much. I just do it. Um, but I can show you how you do that because you need to look for like in the waveforms or something you need to find a reference uh, you, first you need one reference uh, to kind of figure out where the clips are because we also have two angles sometimes and then it's a bit more difficult to sync them uh, but yeah we synced everything in Resolve like when you have the time code generator like I do for the the pocket cinema camera this is the tentacle sync when you have this one with the pocket it syncs perfectly so it all depends on like your uh, your camera as well with the gh5 i feel like it's very unpredictable so this one it works good with it works good with the ursa uh, the c300 i think it works okay with as well uh, but as long as you don't mess up like i did with the recorder sometimes Uh, Charles Backe, will you explain line of action more in depth? Yeah, I can actually do that. Pretty simple, I think. So when you have an interview like this, for, uh, for instance, so he's, this is, is him, he's looking that way. 
if you go like j let's just imagine that there's a line here going like straight through him in like his chest so one line would be like this side to our our side when you jump over to this side behind and shoot towards the camera that would be breaking the line of action because the, the imaginary line would be going like straight through him so if you would be like on this side filming to to uh, the other side of him you would feel a bit uh, I guess lost as an audience like what's the perspective how do you how are you supposed to look now sometimes if you have close-ups you actually don't care so much about it and it can be an aesthetics choice as well but I think that for the most part you want to avoid it if you don't know that that it's supposed to be that way but the way that you get through it if you have that is to have like a detail of something so let's just say you would have this for instance any detail like this would kind of break the uh, the rule like you can go to this a small detail and then go out again to the other side that would be like the proper way of doing it uh, but then all the rules they are supposed to be broken once you maybe learn them or something that's at least how I think about it um, yeah uh, Gabe Hobbs also continues on the sinking thing uh, wasn't sure if you used sinking tools in result actually the the waveform sinking works pretty good I think I usually use that when you can but often when I shoot I'm actually like just running around in different places I'm far away I'm close so it's very unreliable because of that when you have like a scene where everything is controlled and you're close all the time or something then it's easy then like resolve manages all the time but when you are moving freely with the camera and all of a sudden you have like different places that you're at then it can be sometimes difficult to sync the waveform syncing thing especially if you have long takes which you usually have when you shoot docs um, how much do you try to pair up characters uh, in Pearl of Africa the pair had such nice dynamics yeah I think that's super important to think about like we cost the characters that we work with nowadays like we really think like about the cinematic quality in terms of, of the narrative before we cast so if if we say we have like a concept for this film that is about or in the beginning was something different but right now uh, and it might change but right now it's about the community that lives in Kino and it's about like them having trouble with each other uh, and being on on like the breaking point of like okay either they have to come together and fight the like the outside forces uh, that wants them to move or they have to like just move and and end everything uh, and maybe Kino dies like it's it's on that breaking point type of thing and then from that concept of having uh, that like bigger picture type of conflict then you add things like okay a mining uh, corporation is trying to come in so they become uh, like the the conflict that the town has but then the story in itself is about the community it's not about like the mining at all really it's much more about like the people that live there uh, and how they're affected by it and like certain people are for mining other people are against it so we try to match it up to create a conflict that, that can be uh, cinematic and, and visual um, and that comes down to okay so this place is picked because the place is interesting to see and you have the conflict visually within the the little town you have this tiny town and then it's just surrounded with mining and you have this vast nature and then on top of that you have all the pollution uh, like there's arsenic and stuff in the water you can't drink the water there's a truck coming in with the water into town the drinking water uh, so you have all this aspect that becomes characters in themselves or or it kind of shows the story um, by just being that way so everything from place to um, the characters and, and all that is costed uh, and it's really like well thought out like who do we pick what type of character or why to try to bring the story as as visually uh, interesting as possible to not have to explain the story in an interview that's the the objective with the whole thing
uh, let's see, in the scene, I feel he's a loner and that's his dynamic. But he also talks uh, to you as a viewer or uh, to the camera or so. Yeah, I think that like he, he is a loner. He's also kind of the outcast in the town because it's, uh, he's had this fight with some parts of the town and now he's like, he's thinking of moving, maybe he moves, maybe he doesn't move, but he also loves the town and he wants to be there and he wants to like fight for, for the town. So all the characters pretty much have like, they are very uh, interesting in, in the dynamics because they have like both sides of things. Like uh, one wants to sell his place, but he also loves to fight for the town. Uh, so you just want to get out there, but he also loves to play. So they're like, they're in this place where they don't really know themselves what they want to do. Uh, and he's similar. He's super social, but very much a loner. Uh, and I like that within them that you can't really like say that he's this or that. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me just show you something uh, in a different scene. Which is kind of interesting because when we, when we talk about like B-roll, for instance, because uh, B-roll often it becomes just like coverage type of thing where you try to shoot some shots to to be able to edit, but there's not really a point to it more than like okay, I need the coverage, so you shoot some nice shots. And w as an editor, I just hate that way of of. Uh, working because it it never works like everything looks so weird all the time like the cuts doesn't look natural uh, and I just want to show this scene that we shot because this is a scene that is it's totally um, audio less like there's there we didn't shoot it with an intent to use the audio uh, okay so I haven't seen anything obviously because it's not anything to sync okay here we go so this scene so this is uh, one place here that uh, is in the town this is the Kino City Hotel right across from this one is a different place which is a, a different bar and they're pretty much fighting each other and they are in best friends if we just put it like that um, so what I was thinking through this whole like how do you how do you envision this visually this conflict between them you need to see people in both places to be able to see that going on but you also need to bridge that because then they will talk about like this uh, like they will have different opinions of everything um, and all this is pretty much what you would consider to be b-roll but it it isn't in in my world it's not b-roll it's definitely a roll because if you don't have this you would not be able to tell this story that is about this conflict so in this scene it's it's just uh, a couple here that i'm going to show a little bit of uh, a scene but this is a scene that we don't or we aren't able to record audio because there is a bar and there's a lot of music. So we know that like rights wise, it's not even worthwhile. So we just skip that and shoot it like we're not gonna use that. But it's important to have this scene because all this is used to build up a tension between the two uh, sides uh, in the town. So once you have this established there in this place, you can go to, to the other place, which is uh, the sourdough, which is right across. So let's see if we can get this one, maybe. No, here we go. Okay, so Scott's back is pointed towards the other place. And what I'm thinking is just to use like the blinds and everything to have those as a, as a character, like visually within the story to have like a feel of looking out and try to connect these two places that way rather than trying to explain it and being obvious about it so if we go back to the other scene i've shot some just overlooking the sourdough like through the window and moved a little bit like just tiny bit with the camera just to get like a feel of somebody looking out and this is just to get uh, like the role between these two try to visualize that 
And then I've also done the same if we look at, I think it's here, yeah, exactly. Here I've done the same from the other side, from the other bar. So my idea is to try to visualize this in some way. And for that whole story narrative to work, you need this scene with them, which is just B-roll, it's just, there's no audio or anything, it's just B-roll. But for me it's not, because without this I wouldn't be able to tell that story, because you need them in that place to be able to tell the story, and you need that uh, as a crucial part in this narrative. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if, if like, that makes it obvious but that's just the way that I think about it uh, and the same goes for for the town um, I have a lot of shots that is like me and Maddie running around with a different camera just shooting everything uh, in the town and because we don't really know what the, what the story is we're trying to capture the essence of the town some things might become like okay so this is a centerpiece of the story we don't know that yet but we're trying to shoot with a purpose in terms of like what this is trying to capture a certain thing which is the essence of this place and and the whole conflict within the city and that's super important for the story so to like look at it as b-roll i feel isn't making it like the justice that it needs because when you see this, like the Kino City Hotel, we know that that's one key part of this. We know that that's a centerpiece in the story. So we want to hone in on like those things and try to capture the essence of that. Uh, and that for me is, is like crucial if you want to tell a visual story. The same goes for the drone footage. Like you don't just go up and, and shoot with a drone uh, without a purpose. So what we focused on here is is like the the turn piles or what I think they're called turn piles right <sighs> resolve hates h264 from DJI that you should know uh, but uh, those drone shots like this is the mill for instance the town is right to the left of this um, that's a centerpiece so we shoot all the stuff that we shoot with some purpose of telling a story and I think that's how people need to really think about it when they think about b-roll not as like just something that you shoot just everything to be able to cut which it often becomes it's just like a wasteful way of shooting if you've shot film you know that that's not an economical way of shooting I don't shoot much more than what I use usually so usually I use pretty much everything that I shoot um, and the film becomes the length that it holds up for. So for Pearl of Africa, I guess it was like 70, I don't know, 74, 78 minutes. Uh, and I wanted it to be 90, but it didn't hold up for that. So then cut, it, cut, 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 and it ended up being that. So you should kill your darlings, I think. Um, yeah, but let me just get some questions before I go to the scene with Dirk and Tracy, who was in the bar here. Uh, a hotel with no windows sets the mood <laughs> and tells a story. All other hotels are 100% windows. Yeah, it's just one window, I think, <laughs> actually. It's one window. <laughs> Pretty amazing, I think. Um, Misha Abres, hey man, love your content. I'm super excited to get my pocket for okay and you inspired me a lot love from canada oh thanks um it's a great camera i haven't shot with it in a week or so but hopefully very soon video output low let me know if it's messing up the stream might be um anyway do you use the multicam feature a lot in Resolve for multi-angled interviews or manual syncing is still better? Um, Hogi Virjono? Butcher that, I think. Um, I do. I like using the multicam, actually. Uh, let me see if I can find one that is. Like, when, when we have stuff like that, then multicam makes sense. Um, but I don't think we have 
uh, this one yeah the last scene or the first scene so the first scene in this whole series was actually multicam uh, so if you want to see how I use that it's the oh, probably need to uh, link it in the show notes but this one let me show you how I ended up using it scenes festival ground sculpt I think it's this one so all this is a multicam uh, clip so it's it's my camera and it's Maddie's camera it's just so simple when you when you work with the multicam um, you would change this one to where do you do it is it here yep multicam Uh, uh, why isn't it changing? Does not love those drone shots. Man, it's not working. This is a bug. Come on. This might actually be because I'm recording with OBS at the same time. But anyway, it might also be a bug. You don't know. But why isn't it opening? Let me see what happens. Let me answer some questions before I kill the program. Uh, I'll get back to Multicam soon. B-roll of the loner would be him digging a bit or fixing the stones a bit instead of you making that action uh, the A-roll and it becomes a scene more than just uh, inserts. I mean, if you think about it, like you have a, a as much as you can, you really want to have like action in everything you do. So if, if, for instance, you're um, if you're shooting somebody who's going from one place to uh, to do something, which could be like anything, but for Pearl of Africa we had one scene that I think is is like a good example if you've seen that. But Cleo and Nelson is going up on the top of a mountain, and and it's basically them just going up on a mountain that they haven't been before but the way I envisioned the whole scene was that okay so if if they go up on this mountain they're gonna be like loving each other and it's gonna be this sunset and it's gonna be like emotional just because of them being alone so they forgot about me and they just get emotional because they're up there that's how the directing directing happens uh, so just picking that place and that scene and that environment for them to do something that can like evoke emotions once you have that figured out it's the same with uh, with um, Scott so just like understanding that you want to have him go uh, to uh, f the best thing would be his place where he actually is um, digging and he has this this small mining camp that would be the best place to be and, and shooting that scene that we shot but we could only go to the place where we were at to do that because it was uh, in the spring and it was too rowdy to go there uh, so we ended up there and then you try to make like the best out of it so sometimes you can't get what you kind of wish for and then from that you try to put a narrative together and as long as you have that action him going to take the soil sample you have the context to what is being talked about which is mining so you need to figure out like what type of action can you embody a story in so if it is like going out and digging in the dirt and that's what it is then that's what you gotta build the narrative around and if that would be like him talking about something completely different then that scene would probably be the wrong scene 
to shoot for having that A roll or B roll, whatever you call it, because the action that you're shooting should strengthen and get you into the story and more emotionally engaged in the story. It shouldn't be just a scene, random thing, guy walking in the streets. It should be like a purpose for what street, why is he walking that street, all those things. That's how you should think about it. And for like different uh, scenes, like we have uh, the first uh, session that I did where I edited, uh, I cut him clearing up a festival ground that festival that takes place there is like the centerpiece of the story so it's not just him clearing up like some stuff in the bushes uh, type of thing it's actually like him clearing up the festival ground which is threatened by the mining company and the mill that's on the doorstep of the town and that is like right next to the dirt that they're uh, or the waste that they're putting there so that's the the whole conflict and it's embodied within this festival and the festival is going to be like a a visual part of the story where they're gathering and and trying to uh, like prepare for the festival so you're gonna follow that through the whole story and you need to think about it like that rather than just like have them do like random things in life because that's not gonna like get you closer to telling the story uh, yeah i hope that explains it i don't know it was a long tangent there um but let me just see if i can get this uh, to work again festival ground scott where are you festival ground there we go Think in progress. Is that the right one? I think so. Um, let me see. Did we have a follow up to that? No. What do you think about the Sigma Art zooms for dock shooting? I love the Sigma Art. I like. If there is one lens that I would bring, it's that one. Uh, the the eighteen to thirty five is my go to lens for most things. Like if I can, I'll, I'll use that one always. Um, now I have like effect type of lenses as well so I use like vintage lenses for certain things but I just like the like how versatile it is you can do anything with that one is this whole thing computer everything breaking down on me why is multicam breaking down let me change my mind on multicam in resolve because this is messing up the stream but it could also be just me recording. Uh, okay, so force quit. DaVinci Resolve. Bye bye. I do love the multicam when you have two cameras though. Even though it is not helping me right now. So I'm just going to finish with some questions here. And then show hopefully the Dirk and Tracy thing. Uh, you're one of the only YouTubers that actually teach something worthwhile that I can take with me to my films. Uh, love your thought process and you've been a big inspiration. Love for media. Oh, thank you. Great to hear. Like, that's the intent. Hopefully it can continue to be that way. Uh, 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 why are your videos always so great? Hopefully because they are tailored to your mind. Okay, let me see if we can get the Dirk and Tracy scene. Dirk and Tracy, where are you? Synced. Here we go. There's something very strange going on with Resolve right now.
Why are you messing up my life? <sighs> Let me see. Do I have enough space on my hard drive? Oh, yes. Enough space on this drive. Yes. So why is this not working? Sorry, guys. It's not going to be able to work now if I don't restart, I think. So if you're still thinking about Resolve, let this be a thing to think about. Like th This is actually not something that happens often. Uh, I think this is because I'm recording all this, but you never know. Here we go. Can I see anything? No, there's some bug going on here. I don't know what happened. Can't see the video. Let me show you. This is all I see. Oh, here we go. But it's so slow. I don't understand it. It's not refreshing. Anyway. Oops. Did we get it? Okay, it's back. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, I'll give it one last chance. Um, so first off, I just want to show you something, which is uh, these gaps here that you can see. There's a lot of them, uh, all this stuff. You can actually very quickly just go into uh, this one is, is super effective. Like, first of all, you have this if you want to clean up the tracks, flatten unused clips. It just smashes it together. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was uh, this little thing here, which I really like. Delete gaps. Bye-bye. So it deleted the gaps, so it becomes a little bit easier to start off. So this scene here, this is not cut at all. What I wanted to show you was just how I would go about logging this interview. So this is basically uh, synced by hand, all this. No, I think it was actually synced by waveforms and then I had to uh, resync it one second point four frames by hand because it was a bit off. So you can see two clips that was a bit off. Uh, that's also part of it. You need to kind of look at the lips. Uh, and if you have, for instance, a big screen, it's much easier to see the lips. <laughs> Uh, right now, and then yeah. over, and then over, over Duncan Creek over way, where Duncan Dirk Creek was way, to where Dirk was. What? Now it isn't in sync. Is this in sync? This is in sync. Wind has Fine. to be coming from. And it's not going to be uncovered. And it's not going to be. Un Man, is it in sync if I move it? That's the big question here. So if this is out of sync, it doesn't make sense. Or am trade uh, a potential for contaminated. Okay, it actually is in sync. So don't mind me saying anything more today. So this actually was in sync, and I actually resynced <laughs> it uh, when I didn't have to uh, because I am not very smart. Okay. So let me just show you how I would go about logging this because like generally you want to log interviews so that you get them uh, easy searchable. And this whole scene, like you want to be able to go back to it at any time in the project. You want to be able to go back to a scene and, and find everything. Like the best thing is to transcribe everything because it's easy to just be sitting with a text document and, and just edit stuff and cut like what they say together. Uh, it's so much quicker. That's what I do on the ad projects because you also have the agency that wants to have like their part of it. They want to uh, have an easy way to say uh, what they want to say. So for this, we don't have it transcribed, but it would probably be good to do it. Um, but a way to, to kind of do that without doing it is to log all the questions uh, in the interviews. So let's say we would go to this. There's something about this guy that kind of took off to me. But it was un un unknown to anybody. So when he went to Dawson, 
he went into the yeah, I think he's talking about how Kino was discovered or something how he met town got shut down you know quite a few of the houses got moved down into Elsa and then there was just one oh uh, yeah he's talking about like the the history of everything but what I would do is is usually I would just create a separate clip uh, with this so here we have him he's he talking about the about town that kind of took off the main course of the gold rush and went way into the into the valleys of the McQuestion River and walked literally walked across land into the valley behind this sourdough here it's called Duncan Creek and he was one of the first people actually to find gold here but it was un, un, unknown to anybody so when so my general way of doing this let me just see if I have anything or if I need to do it with this one if we go to the interviews no nothing so the way that I usually work is I, I would like take this out this would be like the interview I would cut everything out that isn't the scene uh, and just make this into a separate uh, clip so I'll just do this now uh, Dirk Tracy interview yeah. so I just like this way of working just because it it um, it shows up in an interesting way in the find oh, browser finder browser whatever uh, so you would just open this up this clip here it's this one so this is the timeline this one but this is the clip that we're going for so you open that up, you go in and you start like it's logging what he's saying. Something about this guy that kind of so let's just say he talked until here. You would put like the in and out point, so O for uh, out, and then this would be uh, the duration that this answer is or this question is or whatever it is. You could do two things: either create a sub clip with just that, that would create a new clip with just that. I think that's a bit messy, so I usually convert the in and out to duration markers, and some of you probably have seen this before. And then you would write, for instance, what the question was. So talking about Kino, uh, how Kino was created, something like that. And then you get all of those here. So you can easily go into an interview and just look at that and then that can then like just be dragged into this uh, and you have that part of the answer that's just the way that I prefer to work so I just wanted to show that before uh, I go to sleep today but let me see if we have some final thing that I can answer here so the preview monitor clips timecode bug uh, to drag folder structure to edit media pool or bin folder in the media page I don't know about that bug I think that yeah this is just me guessing but I think what he's saying is if we have something here let's say we have um, Kino and let's say we would drag something into this folder uh, if you drag a folder let's see do I have something that doesn't have a million things in them outputs maybe nope Ooh. man something that doesn't have a million things okay let's just drag these so mm, packing maybe so you could drag this one into here and then everything would be added there it wouldn't create a folder what I'm thinking that oops I moved something in finder redo copy always stupid to do those things um, but what I think he was saying was that this doesn't create a folder structure that's what I'm guessing 
but if you would drag it to any of these folders it would create a folder structure that's just my guess so you would drag it there then it would import it as it is that's just my guess but if not then you know how to do that um, but thanks guys for watching and let me know for the next session what do you want me to kind of elaborate on in terms of like the the story editing um, what else do you want to know about editing docs comment and otherwise i'll see you soon and uh, there's a video coming out this week about script writing for documentaries so watch that one otherwise see you guys bye bye